Hello and welcome to Bread and Thread, a podcast about food and domestic history. I'm Liz. And I'm Hazel. We are two friends who studied archaeology together and love history and DIYing everything we can. What are you up to? So, you know, one of the things we have in common is making things difficult for ourselves on purpose. Yep. And you know how you sent me some very pretty threads for my birthday? Oh, I did the rainbow ones, yeah. I have assigned each digit from zero to nine a colour, and I'm now cross-stitching the first 10,000 digits of pi in a big square. <laughs> That's amazing. About, how, how big is the square? It's 100 by 100, and 12 rows in. This is okay. my lockdown two project. <laughs> oh, so that's going to be like a filled in square. Oh, yeah. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. <laughs> I need to see this. I, I am sporadically putting updates of it on my Instagram. I love rainbow pie. Uh, what are you up to? Something slightly less <laughs> ridiculous? Um... I'm hand sewing an entire shirt, so <laughs> I, well, guess, I guess you can be the judge of that. Practical. <laughs> um, I've, I've seen the pictures. This is a very good shirt. It's great. It's like a flouncy, romantical 18th century pirate type shirt. Um, I am very excited. I picked that to start with because... It's just like squares and rectangles, so you don't have to worry about trying to make a pattern. Um, and I'm just using like a, a tutorial on YouTube to put it together. Um, but I really like hand sewing. Um, I mean, I don't mind machine sewing, but there's something about hand sewing that's just like really, I don't know, you feel that thing, like you're doing the thing that your ancestors did. Um and it's, it's, you know, like all the repetitive action things, knitting and crochet and stuff, it's calming. Yeah. So I enjoy that. Yeah. It's and it's been... It's trying to do things yourself. Exactly. Yeah. It's that how much of this can I do all by myself? It's really satisfying. Um, yeah. So that's going pretty well. I've got um, almost two sleeves. I just need to put the cuff on my second sleeve. Um and then I can attach sleeves to the body. I'm doing my first gathers. It's very exciting. <laughs> oh, I a picture on Instagram with the, from the end of the sleeve. Yeah, I will put that one up on the, on the Twitter as well. It's very highly satisfying if you like things being neat. <laughs> it really was my swash. <laughs> Why, thank you very much. So um, this is one of our episodes on like food history personalities, and today is this is going to be a journey for everyone involved. Yeah, given what you've told me so far, I feel like sticking to our no swearing rule is going to be <laughs> difficult. Yeah, I think. This episode might be a bit PG. Like, there's nothing terrible that I'm that is going to come out, but it's it's just. Mm, I don't think there's any other day, a way to deal with this man <laughs> and this cookbook. So what what is what is the name of this man? And so his book? this is George Leonard Herter, and his magnum opus. Bull Cook and Authentic Historical Recipes and Practices, published in 1960. Now, George Herter was the owner of a hunting and fishing supply mail order business in Minnesota. And this is during, during the 50s and 60s. Um, and his business had like catalogs that would get sent out and you order what you wanted from the catalog um these catalogs were actually really popular they like turned the publisher into <laughs> one of the biggest commercial publishing houses in the state apparently um yeah 
And George Herter wrote all of the copy for his catalogues. Um, so he started off writing the copy for his catalogues and they were um, apparently just like completely, um, like imagine like a market stall um, crier, but kind of on speed or something like they're really really exaggerated like nothing nothing in this catalog is ordinary it's all like the famous fish hook or like the world's best whatever um like you would be the worst kind of person not to buy this <laughs> over the competitor um yeah they're quite you know they're quite entertaining um do you have any examples? uh i I don't think I wrote any down specifically, um, but yeah, they're, they're definitely described as like, you know, like this is the famous thing, product, whatever it is. Um, and he kind of spilled over into writing books. So he obviously had this flair for writing and for telling a story and making things sound you know, attention grabbing. And so... One of his books, probably the most well-known of his books, is his cookbook, Bull Cook and Authentic Historical Recipes and Practices. Um, and Bull Cook apparently is the person in a camp, like a logging camp or whatever, that is the cook's assistant and does chores and stuff, um, like handyman. Yes, sir. He basically called his cookbook The Dog's Body, which I feel is a yeah. bold move, but I feel like one that would only go down well in the 60s. I feel like also it was kind of aimed at his target audience, though, as people that are into hunting and fishing, because that is that whole kind of like outdoorsman, rugged individual, like handyman, um, survivalist thing. And a lot more toxic masculinity yeah. with it but it's just in, instead of going in maybe just a more normal <laughs> direction he went in a third <laughs> wilder direction uh, and it's interesting that this is a 1960s cookbook aimed at men um so it's mm. it's meant to be like well part of it is about um you know what you can do with the the game that you hunt and fish and stuff um but Part of it, I mean, most of it, as, as you will see, <laughs> isn't really about that. Um, before we get kind of dive into that, I just want to, I just want to tell you the titles of his other books because there were many. I mean, there was a page in his catalog that just listed all of the books. Um, so okay. <laughs> George Herter, um, often published in conjunction with his wife Bertha, who was French, I think. Bertha Herter. Herter. <laughs> Indeed, I didn't even realise that. <laughs> it's unfortunate. Um, so, also was the author of such books as Herter's Professional Course in the Science of Modern Taxidermy and How to Get Out of the Rat Race and Live on $10 a Month which is apparently by moving to Alaska <laughs> and fishing by electricity. <laughs> by electricity? Yeah, about... Like in the Simpsons where they just put the book oh, in the I lake. I think it is something like that, actually. <laughs> I'm not, I've not read this book, but um, from what I gather, it's, it's that kind of um, zone. <laughs> um, oh, and... and not forgetting his marriage guide titled How to Live with a Bitch, <laughs> of which the second edition informs you that you should never, ever, under any circumstances, call your wife a bitch. I think it's the second edition. Bertha had some words. <laughs> I think didn't some she? words were had between Bertha and George. <laughs> <laughs> So this is, I mean, just to give you an idea of like, this guy clearly just was like, okay, I know some stuff about this. Clearly I'm an authority, let's write a book. <laughs> or even just like, I have some opinions on this. Um, and 
just yeah was able to sell them self-publish them easily and sell them through his own catalog so i mean i guess if you've got your marketing right there why not it makes sense yeah <laughs> it's early vanity publishing isn't it yeah um and i mean i guess that is a fine tradition i mean one of the ways in which people would get books published in the past was just by raise like if you were uh, an aristocrat or like a fashionable person or something you could just raise a subscription amongst your friends to to get yourself published so yeah um so Hertz incorporated uh hunting and fishing outdoor supply company um i think it was bought out by another company but some of their products still have the Hertz name so i think it's still floating around today but the Hertz business um went under in 1981 more of which later <laughs> so i'm gonna now read you the introduction to the book and it is interesting <laughs> so uh let me just check if i put that in my document I did. Okay. So, full cook and authentic historical recipes and practices. And this is the entire introduction. It's not long. In the lumber camp days and pioneer days, the cooks learned from each other and the old world cooks. Each taught the other his country's cooking secrets. Out of the mixing came fine food prepared as nowhere else in the world. I am putting down some of the, these recipes that you will not find in cookbooks. Each recipe here is a real cooking secret. I am also publishing for the first time authentic historical recipes of great importance. For your convenience, I will start with meats, fish, eggs, soups and sauces, sandwiches, vegetables, the art of French frying, desserts, how to dress game, how to properly sharpen a knife, how to make wines and beer, how to make French soap, what to do in the case of hydrogen or cobalt bomb attack keeping as much in alphabetical order as possible. One of these <laughs> things is not like the other. So, um, what do you do in case of hydrogen bomb attackers die? Like, that's a short yeah, chapter. a lot of this seems to be, I mean, it's very 1960s America. It's like, yeah, like this is a point when the UK government was putting out leaflets saying, "Oh, if you hear an alarm saying that there's a nuclear strike coming, hide in a cupboard and you'll be fine." Yeah, yeah. My nan was part of the um, volunteer ambulance drivers. Like she trained to drive ambulances just in case there was a a nuclear attack. But like that's what you know. The threat was people felt the threat was that real at the time. Like, it could happen any time. No, I'm, I'm, I'm less the threat was real, the threat was absolutely real. And I'm more, the governments knew that this would all do <laughs> nothing. Think, yeah, it is. <laughs> feel better. I feel like, yeah, it make, makes you feel like the government is doing something about it when <laughs> there's like, not much you can do and and his advice just in case you wanted to know what the advice is in yeah. case of a hydrogen bomb attack in this cookbook um, if we have a bomb attack it will be a heavy one with every major city and most of the country wiped out in less than a half hour in reading some of the official rot put out about survival in case of a bombing attack it shows that the people putting him out putting it out have no first-hand knowledge of what they are talking about and George Herter does apparently <laughs> and, and very few people did at that point and most of them weren't and most of them were dead yeah. <laughs> um I mean his justification for this is that he's uh experienced bombing and talked to a lot of people who got bombed during the second world war which I'm sure he did, but like that's not the same thing as a nuclear bomb attack. He's thinking about like, so he's thinking about like carpet bombing. No, no, he he's like on about radiation and stuff. His advice for what you should do, um, 
get in any kind of cave, ditch or valley as far away from buildings as you can and lie on the ground face down. And just in case you didn't get that, the next sentence is, if at all possible, get in a cave. Oh, a, a ditch. Yes, if you lie mm. in a ditch, you'll be safe from the yeah. radiation. Mm. Yeah, but it's fine because also according to this book, people who eat a lot of red peppers are immune to radiation. Okay, that's where they were going <laughs> wrong. Um, I Okay, I was just checking what I wrote just in case I misremembered that. But no, the quote is literally, people who use considerable red pepper in their foods are almost immune to atomic radiation. Wait. This, this sentence is unclear. Instructions unclear. Do we eat red peppers or the seasoning red pepper? No, red bell peppers, yeah. Okay. See, that that's good, because I eat a lot of those. I don't eat a lot of red okay. pepper. <laughs> I mean, one of those things is right. I, just, I looked this up, because I was like, that? I mean, that's such a wild claim. There must be some kind of truth to it. Um, so I looked it up, and uh, the only thing I found, apart from a website which included it in a diet that's supposed to reverse the dangers of electromagnetic fields, um, which there's no evidence that they're dangerous in the first place. So, um, that's yeah, that's a whole other thing. thing. I, I mean, I looked that up and it was like, yeah, no. Um, anyway, the other thing, the, the only thing that I found that I guess you could relate to that is that they contain a lot of vitamin C, like they contain more vitamin C than oranges and lemons. Um, so I guess they're really good for your immune system. Like they're recommended in the diet of people who are undergoing cancer treatment for that reason. But they're not like the vitamin C isn't going to make you immune to radiation. In his defense, radiation poisoning and scurvy have some <laughs> similar symptoms. <laughs> That's as much as I'm giving him. I, guess, I mean, yeah. <laughs> wow maybe maybe it's not totally his fault <laughs> that's cool I didn't know that I mean it's not cool but <laughs> um, yeah so I, I, you'll be getting a feel for what this book this book is like a combination of cookbook advice guide, survival guide. Um, and it also contains these absolutely bizarre historical anecdotes. Um, like he... How, how historical are the historical anecdotes on a scale of like one to ten? <laughs> okay, well, um, historical air quotes. Uh, he introduces a lot of his, of, of the recipes in the book um with a little historical note like this is the person who invented the recipe or this is where it became popular um and as you might imagine <laughs> they're not fantastic um i mean it it contains the assertion that johannes kepler um a 18th century german astrologer has been largely forgotten for his work on astronomy but will forever be remembered as the creator of Liverwurst. <laughs> I think that there are certain astronomers who would disagree. Yeah. Like, maybe the the ones that named the planet <laughs> after Kepler? I mean... Or NASA, who had a Kepler telescope? They might disagree there. Or maybe they just really loved German sausage. <laughs> Could be. I'm trying to figure out if this book was written like solely to be entertaining, or whether or not he actually. I mean, he obviously just made this stuff up, but I'm not sure to what degree he expected people to believe it. <laughs> I mean, it's 2020. <laughs> I'm willing to believe anything of anyone at this point. <laughs> Okay, so I'm saving the greatest recipe in this entire book for last. Um, it's going to be great. Okay. But let's have a look at some of the other 
you know, choice things that are mentioned in here. Um, so first of all, corned beef. Um, so I'm not sure if I've ever had corned beef, actually. But corned beef is has actually nothing to do with corn, like I thought it did, apparently. It's called that because the process of making it is salting it with like large grains of salt that apparently um, are a bit like corn. That's where the name came from. So Herta, Herta says that corn meat originated in the town of London, England in 1725 and was invented by a chemist called John Wilson. The real secret of producing true corned meat is known only to a very few people and they guard their secret very carefully. Although some cookbooks and food editors and magazines from time to time publish recipes for corning meat, these recipes are not even close to the real one. This is the first time the real authentic recipe for corning meat has ever been published. No. <laughs> So let's ignore the fact that during this period, Ireland was one of the biggest exporters of corned meat. Um, I mean, the earliest reference I can find to corned beef is in the 17th century. And the technique is thought to be older. So I, I'm not really sure where this very specific date comes from. But I, I kind of like the confidence in this paragraph. Just oh, yeah. the sheer confidence of saying this, <laughs> this recipe has never been published before. I am the only one who knows the truth. It it does slightly. It it has the vibe of a Tumblr post that starts with "Listen up," <laughs> and I appreciate that. I mean, it's if there's one. If there's one word you can do, use to describe this cookbook, it is ballsy, or perhaps ballsy. <laughs> um, it's great. He's very derogatory about imported uh, beef from South America. Um, I mean, presumably he's trying to encourage new people to um, hunt and process their own meat using stuff from his catalogue. <laughs> but not beef. You don't. You but don't not beef. beef. No. Um, well, he says that you can corn venison, antelope, moose, bear, or beef with this method. I don't know who's out there corning bear. <laughs> Someone a lot braver than me. <laughs> <laughs> How do you corner bear very carefully? <laughs> um, this book also contains a recipe for snapping turtles, Scandinavian style. As far as I'm aware, snapping turtles are only found in North America. Yeah, they're very much in a new world creature. But, mm. but sure. Um... So yeah, I mean maybe maybe that's just like the Scandinavian method of doing so. I, I don't even know. Um I also don't know why well, you want to eat it might snapping be turtles. A Scandinavian way of doing turtles in general. Perhaps. Although I'm not I mean, entirely convinced that Scandinavia has turtles, I'm gonna find out. <laughs> this this is um history in real time. Um I I'm not sure a snap. I don't know if a turtle would be particularly tasty. Like, I don't know if a. Okay, no, they're all sea turtles. Okay. Oh, cool. So maybe it's a way of doing sea turtles. I'm. I'm gonna give him the benefit of the doubt because I love him so much. Viking turtles. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. We're also gonna talk about the martini. Oh. Yeah. This. Now, um, yeah, martini was a very, very popular cocktail in America at this time um, and remains today, you know, one of the classic cocktails. Um, so have you um, 
I mean, you're you're interested in drinks history and stuff, even if you don't drink. Um, do you know what's in a martini? Um, uh, gin and vermouth. Yeah, I think that's the traditional martini. Like it's it's gin and vermouth. Um, and you know you can have more or less gin to vermouth in it. You can have an olive or a cocktail onion. Apparently, that's a Gibson. Um, or you can have a splash of olive water in it, which is a dirty martini. Um, yeah, so according to George Leonard Herter, the martini drink is strictly German and was invented by J.P. Schwarzendorf, a German music composer born in 1741 and who died in 1816. His nickname was Martini. <laughs> um, a German's nickname was Martini, you say? Yeah, he apparently invented this drink and his friends promptly named it after his nickname. Um, so he's very, very derogatory about the quality of martinis that are served in America today. Um, it's apparently this German martini is far superior to the slop called and served as martinis in American bars and homes today. Here it is in the correct and original recipe. And he then goes on to insist that a true martini does not contain vermouth because vermouth is nothing but a cheap spice flavored white wine and was originally made in order to get rid of wine too poor to sell on its own. The idea of using vermouth in martinis was the sole idea of unscrupulous importers of vermouth who simply wanted to promote its sale and are the kind of people that will do anything to make money. So I'm glad it's the martini specifically. Because I do know the history of the martini. Oh, great! Because I looked that up a little bit, but um, it's most. I feel like you might after, know a bit more than me. So. It's most likely named after a brand of vermouth called martini. Okay. So I would argue the vermouth's the most important ingredient. <laughs> I mean, yeah. From what I can gather, the vermouth has always been involved. Um, there's, I mean, yeah. I, I. Um, came across that i also came across yeah, the idea that was invented in the during the gold rush or something um but either way it's definitely an american drink it's definitely american definitely has vermouth those are like the two things <laughs> about martinis yeah I, I don't know what this man has against vermouth um <laughs> He also says an American martini is still just a drink for alcoholics who want a quick alcohol jolt regardless of taste. Gosh. I feel like um, he was probably one of those people that's like, oh, pour a glass of gin and then show it a bottle of vermouth. Mm. So, sorry, I've just, I've just read the next paragraph, which I hadn't read before. Schwarzendorf invented another drink, which he named the Martini Verboten. <laughs> Just a big martini. That's the name of my next D and D character. <laughs> oh, that would be oh, that would be such a great like to stage. Elaborate. <laughs> what is in the forbidden martini? <laughs> the forbidden martini. Uh, <laughs> The forbidden martini. Oh, he gives the formula. This is this is brilliant. Uh, two ounces of Geneva or gin. Geneva is like um, a, a historic European spirit that's kind of a precursor to gin. Um, one ounce of apple cider vinegar, and that's it. It's gin and vinegar. It's gin and vinegar. So I was going to say, I'll make. The forbidden martini, a cocktail next time I have a party, but I I think I'm gonna not do that. No, please don't. <laughs> um, yeah, he says this drink tends to calm down a heavy drinker to get away from the overdry after drinking mouth of a heavy drinker, and it prevents liver damage to the alcoholic. So this drink is mostly gin, and he's saying that it won't be too dry. I mean, yeah, is that hey, is that just you the know, vinegar <laughs> makes it not dry? I've never done vinegar. I don't know. Um, the martini found its way to America by isolated music lovers. 
<laughs> Apparently, we can verify these facts in a French dictionary, um, which I, I'm definitely going to do. I will follow up with this on Twitter, guys. You're I'm going to find a French dictionary. <laughs> I'm going to get to the bottom of this. It's called the Nouveau Petit La Russe. Oh, Nick, Nick knows about La Russe. It's a big, important food book. Okay. The Russe Gastronomique is like a big important food book. Oh, cool. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna get to the bottom of this mystery <laughs> for all of you. Um watch watch the Twitter. <laughs> uh so there there you go. Yep, the martini was German the whole time. Who knew? Um <laughs> I, mean, I should have guessed from that Italian sounding name. Of course. <laughs> um just to throw you off the set. Yeah, um So yeah, he he also includes these apparently historical recipes. Um and you know, they include they're usually tied to a person. So like apparently he has Brant's list fruit cocktail recipe okay. which includes the instruction go and buy a can of fruit cocktail which i'm sure was available to frank's list um, when was list um i'm pretty sure list was in an, an 18th century was he uh, 19th. maybe not oh cool okay so maybe my classical music knowledge is not fantastic like i don't think um, canned food was really a thing then but maybe Ah, Maybe. I, I don't know. Um, I'm not entirely sure how verifiable this is. I do food. like. The, I like food. that you're. I like that you're taking part the part of the champion of George Herter. I mean, someone has to. <laughs> yeah. Um. He also includes apparently Hitler's recipe for omelettes, Genghis Khan's favorite duck recipe, um, and he introduces a recipe called Toulouse Lautrec chicken using Toulouse Lautrec's two friends painting, um, which which is interesting. Uh, because that's about two people who are definitely having sex. <laughs> well, maybe afterwards they got hungry. <laughs> maybe. Um, the idea that, like, if in the 60s you have one of Hitler's recipes, that's suspicious. Yeah. I, mean, I think... I think his claim here is that he's travelled around, and I think he did travel around Europe, and he's collected all of these recipes. And um, the second volume, there's a second volume of this, by the way, and the second volume uh, is about the the restaurants and nightclubs of the world. Um, the second volume has not been reprinted. This book, the first volume, has been reprinted. So you can, if you wish, go out and buy a copy of this. And honestly, I'd recommend you do because it's hilarious. Um, and apparently, um, according to you know general opinion, does contain some good tasty recipes, um, presumably that were contributed by Bertha, <laughs> <laughs> um, including the the greatest recipe in this book. Okay, um, and this is one of the historical ones, which get kind of wilder and wilder um, until you get to this one, and the title of this recipe is spinach mother of christ and i'm going to read you this word for word the virgin mary mother of christ was very fond of spinach <laughs> this is a well-known fact in nazareth today as it was 19 centuries ago her favorite music was that of the crude bagpipes of that time and this also is a well-known fact a recipe for preparing spinach spread with Christianity throughout Europe. On the eve of Christ's birth in the cave that was called a stable, her only meal was spinach. Okay, so you know how I'm playing devil's advocate here? 
Mm -hmm. There are some versions of the nativity that have Mary giving birth in a cave. Okay. Binet was likely domesticated in the Middle East. Really? And the Romans had bagpipes. Okay. I'm just putting um, these three I'm... facts out there. Okay, because I mean, I looked this up and I found a quote that said um, that they didn't have spinach in the Medi in the Middle East at the time, but um, but then like I don't know. <laughs> well, what, what I found is um, that it was domesticated in probably Persia. Okay. So like oh. maybe. Well, okay. I mean, I'll I'll give that. Uh... <laughs> A hard maybe. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm in no um, way saying that this is probably a true fact. I'm just putting some information out there. <laughs> no, I like it. I like it. It gives this, uh, you know, a bit of a... Um, I was going to say true crime, but that's not what I'm going for. <laughs> it gives, gives this a bit of an unsolved mysteries edge. Mm. And I like that. <laughs> So, um, yeah, this is apparently the Virgin Mary's own recipe for spinach. Okay. <laughs> so you're saying that this is the spinach that Jesus ate? Uh, yeah, I guess. Um, like, I, does I that just... sound good? What, what, what do you do with the spinach? Ah, okay. Um, so it's, I mean, it's really simple. It's just fresh spinach fried with garlic and butter. That's it. I mean, that does sound tasty. It does. It sounds nice. It's just wilted spinach it's, it's with garlic. Kind of, I mean, it's, it's not that um, mind blowing, though. <laughs> Well, you know, it, um, was, it was simpler back then. You just put some garlic on stuff and that was your flavour for the week. <laughs> back in my day, okay. we only had one clove of garlic. Oh, to be fair, Middle Eastern food kicked butt. It was just <laughs> Europe that didn't know how to do food. Oh, gosh. Yeah. I mean, yeah, this, this straight up sounds tasty. I'd do it. Um, I mean probably have eaten that actually but i'm i'm not convinced that this recipe was created directly by the virgin mary herself and has been preserved by her followers through the ages no that's that seems unlikely <laughs> but i want it to be true but this is i mean this, this is just to get across the degree of sheer audacity <laughs> this man possesses. <laughs> yeah. Because, I mean, he's he seems, for all intents and purposes, to be, like, this guy was pretty Christian. I mean, his the second volume of this ends with a kind of completely random rant about birth control. Um, sure. <laughs> Apparently it's killed more people than the atomic bomb, according to George Hatter. I would <laughs> like to know how Bertha Hertha felt about this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For sure. But, uh, yeah, apparently he's <laughs> no, no problem <laughs> with spinach mother of Christ. Um, yeah. Anyway, I I will leave that as another unsolved mysteries esque. Um, I'm just I'm just going to present that recipe and do with it what you will. Try it out, please do. Send us pictures of your wilted spinach. <laughs> I really want to have a bull cook dinner party where everything is from this book. Yes, <laughs> including the forbidden martini. Including the forbidden martini. <laughs> so, if you enjoyed that and you want to fund the bull cook dinner party, we do have a Patreon um, <laughs> where you can get access to a patron server, uh, exclusive recipes, and 
at the $10 a month level, we will make a bonus episode just for you. So you can go to patreon.com slash bread and thread. You can also find us on Twitter at bread and thread. Or if you'd like to submit any ideas for episodes um, or local ladders or you just want to say hi, bread and thread podcast at gmail.com. Um, oh, and I'd just like to, um, to, to end with the, I guess the end of Herter's. Herter's closed in 1981 um, amid allegations of massive unfilled order, orders and in quite a lot of debt. Um, but his name lives on. And he's actually like a bit of a resurfacing celebrity today. So, <laughs> so what you're saying is we're on trend. We, we are indeed. <laughs> we are brand influencers. <laughs> I, well, I guess we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs>